a one method or one approach that overcomes basically all limitations um, of the previously mentioned approaches may be termed sound field synthesis. And the concept is illustrated in these two simulations. So we're looking at a portion of space. This is one, so could be, for example, top-down view on the horizontal plane. Here we have one spa spatial dimension and another spatial dimension. And uh, we're looking at the sound field that is radiated by a virtual sound source. In this case, it's a spherical wave um, that is radiated by a source that is located at this position. And the idea behind sound field synthesis is that you distribute many, many loudspeakers around the receiver, around the listener area, and you drive these individual loudspeakers of this large ensemble such that the sound fields that they emit, they superpose and produce a copy of the desired sound field. So if you compare the sound field inside this square, which uh, is the assumed listener area, there's a receiver area in this case, and the sound field in the corresponding area on the left plot, then you will see that they coincide very much. There's tiny differences, um, but conceptually um, they are the same. The limitation of this is that theoretically this is all possible if we have a continuous distribution of loudspeakers, meaning we have a, a continuous layer of an infinite amount of infinitesimally small loudspeakers. If that is the case and our target volume is enclosed with a surface of loudspeakers, then we can perfectly reproduce any sound field that is possible in uh, real life. That would be perfect reproduction. Unfortunately, real world systems, they look more like this. So they are composed of a very finite set of discrete loudspeakers at a certain spacing. Um, which has the consequence that the sound field synthesis is only correct below a certain frequency, which is called spatial aliasing frequency. Um, so this uh, array that you see here um, is the one I worked with um, at the, when I was at the University of Technology in Berlin. It is composed of 56 loudspeakers arranged on a circle with a diameter of 3 meters. And you see uh, one more time um, the same loudspeaker, this time in a simulation. So let's, let's compute and let's solve all these required integral equations that describe the, the situation. And to compute the loudspeaker signals that would be required to produce a straight wavefront that propagates upwards in the plot. If we're limiting the frequency content of that plane wavefront to frequencies below the aliasing frequency, which is somewhere around 1700 Hertz in this case, then uh, it looks as follows. Uh, this is where the wave propagates. Let's stop here. We can see that the wave front is indeed very straight. There is a little bit of stuff behind the wave front, but this is not an artifact of the method. This is a consequence of the fact that we're using only lower frequencies or that we allow the, the wave to carry only lower frequencies. Um, so please ignore this. We can see a plane wavefront, a straight wavefront that does indeed propagate upwards in the plot. So that looks very successful. But if we're allowing also higher frequencies, which we will need uh, for a high quality audio reproduction, we need frequencies up to 16, 17, 18 kilohertz or even higher. If you're using one particular solution, which is called wave field synthesis, um, which happens to use only the lower loudspeakers in order to produce a wave that propagates upwards. So white filling uh, indicates that these loudspeakers are not active in this particular scenario. Um, and now we allow the entire audible frequency range in terms of uh, signal content. And again, we drive the system to produce a straight wave, plane wave that propagates upwards. We can see that, yes, we have again a very straight wavefront, if it is much sharper than on, in the previous simulation, that's because simply we also have high frequencies um, which allow for this um, wavefront to be more pronounced. But what we see is that behind the desired wavefront, we have additional wavefronts that propagate in different directions. Here you can see it clearly. And these are called spatial aliasing. And they are a consequence of the fact that we're not using a continuous layer 
of loudspeakers, but a very discrete one um, uh, with a finite number of loudspeakers. Um, there's unfortunately nothing we can do about this, but interestingly, when listening to, when doing this in practice and listening to this, um, it turns out that this spa the impairment due to spatial aliasing, the perceptual impairment, meaning um, how much worse the sound is, um, is much lower than you would think. So these systems, they can sound really excellent um, when, um, when designed and driven properly. And typically, these systems, they use spacing between the loudspeakers, which is in the order of 10 to 15 centimeters, and that causes a spatial aliasing frequency somewhere between 1500 and uh, 100 hertz and 1500 hertz and 2000 hertz. So to summarize, the upsides are it is multi-user and the downsides are it's an incredible amount of hardware that you need. So if you want to equip a cinema with such a loudspeaker system that is only horizontal, then you already need something in the order of four or five hundred loudspeakers. If you're thinking 3D, if you want to enclose the, a, a cinema with a with a surface of loudspeakers with 15 centimeters spacing, you need thousands and thousands and thousands. The largest system that exists nowadays in the world is installed uh, also at University of Technology in Berlin and it uses 800 uh, in the, or more than 800 independent channels, but it's also horizontal only um, because otherwise the hardware, the required hardware would be prohibitive. Wave field or sound field synthesis in general, there's also other methods besides wave field synthesis, but um, um, this one is the most uh, popular and the, the one and the only one that is, can be properly implemented in practice. The upside of sound field synthesis is the ability to render what is called focused sources. They, these constitute the following. A focused source is not really a sound source or not a virtual sound source. It is a sound field that converges towards a point, then it passes the point, and then the sound field diverges on the other side of that focus point. And the diverging part of the sound field resembles very much the wavefronts that would, uh, that would be apparent if there were a sound source at the location of the focus point radiating sound. So a user located in the diverging part of that sound field will will localize a sound source uh, at the location of the focus point so in mid-air in front of the loudspeakers and that can be very impressive so you can for example put raindrops in a rain scene inside the audience area with other methods like stereophony or ambisonics or so simple ambisonics then um, if uh, you will you will you will be feeling like sitting in a dry bubble and the rain is taking place somewhere at the distance of the loudspeakers or even further, this is something that can be mitigated with uh, focus with focus sources in sound field synthesis. Let's also look at a time domain uh, simulation of this. This uh, dot um, represents the focus point, and now we're looking only at lower frequencies. So um, this uh, is without spatial aliasing. Then we can see that indeed the sound the wavefront converges to the focus point. It passes the focus point, and now the diverging part very much resembles the wavefronts that would uh, be apparent if this focus point were radiating sound. So clearly, a person located in oh, excuse me in the diverging part of the sound field will localize a sound source in front of the loudspeakers in midair. A person located in the in the converging part of the sound field will localize whatever. And it depends on the head orientation and many other situations. So this will be a bit irritating and should be avoided.